Peter Asher and Gordon Waller, who are they? Well, it was Peter and Gordon, if you bought their records. They were inspired by Buddy Holly. Their biggest seller was called World Without Love. Now, Peter Asher's sister, Jane, used to date Paul McCartney. Paul had, had written a number of hits for us, you know, and he came uh, and he'd written this song and thought it would be successful for us. So he came and uh, asked us if we wanted to sing it. But um, he said that, he, he, you know, people kept saying, oh, well, these songs are only hits because they've got Len McCartney's name on them. They don't even have to write good songs anymore. So he said to us that he'd like to find out if it could still be a hit without his name on it. And we replied... We'd love to have a hit without your name on it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, actually, what you said, it was Bernard Webb in England, and over here, it was someone called A. Smith. Yeah, they used a different pseudonym over here for some okay, reason. But and the facade collapsed pretty quick, by the way. But, but, long, but it stayed long enough to prove that it could be a hit under another name. Yeah, but when the, when the record came out, one of the reporters said, this stinks of Paul McCartney. But in those days, when they toured North America, your sister was going with Paul, and every move she made or he made was reported. Jane, actually. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, he knows this. Sister. Yes. <laughs> she is your sister, right? She is, and she still is. Still and is. <laughs> that, that must have been interesting. Well, it was very odd because, of course, she's, she was a, success, you know, a successful actress and still is. So, I mean, there were weird moments. Like, at one point, she was touring America with the Royal Shakespeare Company doing Romeo and Juliet. And, and but there'd be, you know, Fan, Beatle fans coming probably to see Shakespeare for the first and only time in their lives, but coming just to see Jane, you know, and, and waiting at the stage door and stuff. So it was, a, it was an odd identity for somebody who, who wanted to be a working actor but suddenly found themselves with this whole other identity. I heard that the two of you came together after all of these years, because you both have had separate careers, yeah. and then you got back together again. Did this come about because of the death of Mike Smith of the Day Not quite, uh, n no. Um, he died very recently, you know, you know which was tragic. No, a couple of years ago, Paul Schaefer from, from The Letterman Show, who's a, who was a good friend of mine, and uh, had called me up and explained that he wanted to organize a benefit to raise money for Mike, who at that point had had a very bad accident and was paralyzed. So, um, uh, and he needed money to fix up his house and stuff like that. You know, the medical care was, was okay because it was in England, but he needed his house fixed. And Paul Schaefer and he had met as fellow keyboard players, and Paul was a fan and a friend, so he wanted to put this together. And essentially, uh, I realized as Paul was asking me this, he said, you know, what would it take to get Peter and Gordon back together again after what had been a 37-year hiatus, you know, a short break. And um, so... Uh, I thought that was when you lifted something too, too heavy. <laughs> I, called, uh, I called Gordon to see uh, what he thought, and, and he agreed with me that this was the one that we, we couldn't really say no to. Mike was a good friend. Gordon knew him better than I did, but, but I was an admirer of his. And Paul was a great friend, and I knew they'd put a great band together. So we kind of went, OK, we'll do it. And, of course, the scary part was that okay. then as it grew near... We realized that it was one thing to say you're going to do it. The second half of the equation was actually bloody doing it. So we. we Pete, Peter <laughs> hadn't sung the songs since 67. Yeah. But, and I've been singing, not, not all of them, but like sort of four or five every time I went, went out and did things. But I sort of added my own A rearranged solo version. You yeah. know, and you know, I put solos in and you know, did extra bits to it. So I had to learn to sing it properly, if you like. So it took a lot of the practicing. Way that Peter and Gordon sung it, and Peter just had to simply learn the bloody songs. So it, it, we we had to do a lot of practicing, and you know I had to I worked out with a vocal coach to get my high notes back or as many as I could find, and and uh, so you know well, we're only two off, aren't we? <laughs> Once we'd made uh, that huge effort, you know, and and got to do these a short set at this uh, benefit, but it was very well received. It was we had great fun doing it. The audience seemed to like it. The press liked it a lot, and, and Fox News did a thing about it, uh, they you know, be, being good and stuff. And so people was then started going, well, look, you know, if you're doing this, there's, there's work out there, you know, and if you're having fun. So we decided to uh, continue. We don't do proper tours or anything, but we do weekends here and there. We, we play whenever it seems like a fun occasion. Influences. How about uh, Don and Phil Everly? Because I hear... Strange to <clears throat> them in your music. I, mean, I think they were terrific. Every every duo listens to the Everly Brothers. Certainly, the Paul and John did. We did. I mean, they are some of the best harmony singers. Though they themselves, of course, learned from the Leuven Brothers and from people who preceded them. But certainly, well, they, they learned from their mum and dad, didn't they? 
Yeah. That too, yes. Yeah. But they're, um, you know, we, we had, a, the, we collected a lot of influences, but I think any pair of voices that sing close harmony listen to the Everleys because they do it almost better than anybody else and still do to this Well, day. not almost, but they do do it better, yeah. I think. I, I've known them since 1959. <clears throat> they're good friends, Don and Phil, of mine, but I have to go and talk to them separately now. You know, I mean, even when the buses pull up, he, Don's in one and Phil's in the other. I know, but that's the thing. With, with When brothers start to... To, to not get on, it's more intense than any other pe pair of people not getting on. I mean, all the way back to Cain and Abel. You have produced records for people like Linda Ronstadt, uh, uh, James Taylor, who's coming to town next month, and all of those. How yes. did you go from the duet into this? You well, production? very briefly, uh, I, 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 was, I was interested in producing records. I was very interested in the process of making our records and grew more interested as time went by. So I started producing records. The first record I produced oddly enough, being with a singer called Paul Jones, who, who uh, uh, you know, was going to play here with the Manfreds, but it got postponed, but who's a great singer. Anyway, I did a record with him. Then I uh, was head of A&R for Apple Records, uh, helping Paul set that up and run it. When I was doing that, I discovered um, this singer-songwriter, James Taylor, who, who, who we met, and I really liked his songs. And this is when I was very interested in producing, so I suggested I produce his records. I did. And I produced his albums for 20 years or so and also became his manager and started a management company. And that, the management company grew to include Linda Ronstadt and Carol King and Johnny Mitchell and Randy Newman and people like that. But, and I produced some of their records, most of James's, all of Linda's, and, and then I produced some other people along the way, Diana Ross and Cher and 10,000 Maniacs and a lot of different stuff. I, I love producing. I still do that a lot. I had some doubts about doing this at all, you know, what, what is it really, why would, why would we want to be two old men singing these hits from years ago? But Because there's a lot of old women and old, other old men out there who want to see it. The audience enjoy it so much, and, and when you get people, you actually look out in the audience, there's somebody crying or something and saying, that's the song I proposed to my wife, or, the, you know, oh, uh, you know, that was our daughter's favorite song when she was one or something, and now she's, you know, 40. 50. It's, you know, it's... it's um, it's kind of fascinating, and you actually realize when you see how much the it means to the audience and how much, it, how much actual happiness it generates, um, you kind of go, this is okay. As a hobby goes, this is a pretty good one, you know? It, it's, it's not like, and you, plus you've lost the intensity when you do it the first time. It's like, where are we on the charts? You know, can we extend the tour? What's the, now we're doing it because it's fun. How many fun. we sold? Yeah, exactly. Now we know the answer to that, you know? And, and, and so we do it for the fun of it and, and actually for the audience is pleasure and it seems to work so that's why it's actually much more fun now in many respects than it was then.